just begin wrapping it up, um, but I think we'll, we'll move expeditiously. Our first speaker will be uh, Balash Berkovitz. Balash. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's always a great, great pleasure to be back in Bloomington, and especially in this conference. Uh, I will talk about some academic disciplines a little bit in line with what uh, Carrie Nelson uh, presented yesterday. So I will talk about Israel as a white colonial settler state in activist social science. I would like to deal with uh, I would like to deal with texts produced by some of those disciplines which belong to a kind of activist social science, namely critical whiteness studies, colonial settler studies, and critical race studies, in which Israel, Zionism, and Jews constitute a supposedly empirical material or the example of the analyses, but also, and more importantly, the target of criticism. How do these disciplines construe Jewish whiteness and imagine Israeli settler colonialism? How and why does the Jewish question emerge once again in these critical works, and what are the methodological and discursive means by which they strive to achieve critique? Due to, due to their academic prestige and scientific aura, and because they are widely taught in academic institutions, these branches of study probably constitute at least one of the major sources on which more overt expressions of anti-Zionism in the public sphere can rely today. They provide theoretical justification and political legitimation for contemporary anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic discourse. Also, because of their academic institutional background, these activist fields of study are probably more immune to criticism than political declarations, which get the most media attention. According to my definition, social science becomes activist when critical and political interest supersedes cognitive interest in the formation of concepts, rendering interpretation and empirical description subordinate to criticism and when the explicit or implicit call for political action supplants theoretical reflection to a large degree. As Adorno, writing about the relationship between theory and practice, puts it, I quote, where experience is blocked or altogether absent, praxis is damaged and therefore longed for, distorted and desperately overvalued. Thus, what is called the problem of praxis is interwoven with the problem of knowledge, end of quote. Undoubtedly, a reflexive science of society is necessarily related to criticism, therefore cannot and should not be a completely neutral enterprise, striving solely to describe or explain. And Adorno would be the last to advocate such a science. However, social scientific analysis might have a tendency or even ambition to become exclusively critical and practice-oriented, in which case it is susceptible to ignore its scientific tasks of explanation and description. This is the reason why, as I will try to show, its politics regulates its methodology and predetermines its empirical findings to a large degree. Critical whiteness studies have been promoted as an activist scholarship. According to its sub-definition, its task is questioning and de-essentializing whiteness as a default color, as neutral, contrasted to people of color. This de-essentializing is arrived at by narrating the process of whitening of different minorities, including that of Jews, in the U.S. context, as social history, uh, and the pioneering work in this respect is Karen Brodkin's How Jews Became White Folks from 1998. <clears throat> in the case of Jews, the story goes as the following. They were discriminated against for a relatively short time period, mostly in the 1920s and 1930s, but this belongs to the past. Jews were not always considered as white, but they became white in a process that lasted for several decades. So whiteness, as an interpretive concept, describes the successful integration of certain minority groups, including Jews, as discrimination against them gradually ceases or attenuates. But whiteness in critical whiteness studies is also meant to express a position of domination and privilege, thereby becoming a critical and not only an interpretive concept. White is not a natural or essential category, as it is the product of a historical process, but neither it is neutral, as it is constituted against the backdrop of those black and colored populations who are still discriminated against. Whiteness as a critical concept is supposed to express that white people as a collectivity, due to embedded racialized structures in society, benefit from their dominant position and are even complicit in oppression. 
And I think that the objective of Bratkin's book is to eclipse or even erase the interpretative content in order to achieve a critical binary, literally a black and white divide. Therefore, assimilating Jews to the most person Assimilating Jews, the most persecuted minority in Western history, to whiteness conceived in this manner is not innocent social history, but has a clear political stake. It has to be proven, first, that the fundamental racial issue is linked to the color line between whites and blacks, or other people of color, while everything else should be considered negligible. And second, the Jews as a collectivity, due to their supposedly powerful and dominant positions in society, partake in the oppression of minorities of color. In Brodkin's book, in a somewhat twisted manner, Jews are sometimes taken to be complicit in oppression also as individuals. In this light, ethnic identities, differences, controversies, alliances between ethnic groups and discrimination on any other basis than color should be considered insignificant. Insignificant will also become the particular traits of anti-Semitism, that is, everything that renders it different from racism. In fact, one of the main methodological principles of whiteness studies dealing with Jews and Jewish assimilation, even if it remains implicit or unstated, is the interpretation of anti-Semitism as just another form of racism having to do with color. However, this tacitly applied methodological principle is converted into an empirical finding as if the history of Jews in the United States followed the pattern of assimilation of every other whitened ethnic group becoming flawlessly integrated into the dominant white majority. And so people who are considered white do not have to endure racism anymore, for they are now placed on the safe side of the color division. As Jews have also become white, by definition there cannot be discrimination against them, or if there is still any, it cannot be systemic. <clears throat> they are excluded from the multicultural space of other dominated ethnic groups, and by the same token, at least in this framework, become part of the dominant and oppressive majority. The slippage into the moral critical meaning of whiteness can only be achieved by intentionally overlooking Jewish history and experience. The interpretive content fades away, although occasionally and accidentally reappears all along Brodkin's book. When talk about Jewish whiteness is meant to establish not only that Jews do not face racism, but also that they are part of the oppressive majority, it is a more or less overtly critical way, to say the least, to address the role of Jews, which can be considered a new way of posing the Jewish question. This is a discursive situation, that Jews are considered as white and part of the majority, to which some academic disciplines contribute greatly, like postcolonial and other related fields of study. As Brian Chayette, the postcolonial theorist but critical of mainstream postcolonialism, puts it, I quote, Jewish experience of modernity can be said to provide fertile templates for understanding questions as varied as minoritarianism, diaspora, nostalgia, racialization, ethnicity, and colonialism, all of which are central concerns in postcolonial studies. But the problem is, that postcolonial studies has not yet been informed by the commonalities with Jewish studies, and also, and more importantly, that these fertile templates are even negated by what Shea terms as supersessionist thinking. Supersessionist thinking is another formulation of the phenomenon identified by the French sociologist Danny Tron in his book The Promise and the Obstacle The Radical Left and the Jewish Problem. Tron tries to establish that many critical approaches regard the memory of the Holocaust as an obstacle to criticism. The Holocaust seems to downgrade the suffering of other people as if there is only a limited amount that could be distributed. From there follow many false strategies of relativization and dejudaization of the Holocaust by critical thinkers, which goes along with the posing of the Jewish question again. But critical theorists are also susceptible to instrumentalize it for the sake of criticism, which is meant by promise in the title of Trump's book. However, it is not only the Holocaust that supersessionist and activist scholarship is trying to combat. As we saw, it is also trying to minor the anti-Semitic phenomenon, and there is also a tendency to place the history of the Israeli state within the theoretical framework of settler colonialism. <clears throat> 
The conception of Jewish whiteness undoubtedly has an, an even greater carrier when racism scholars take Israel as their object of analysis. The critique of whiteness can be developed in two different ways, which already inhere in the concept. One way to pursue the critique is taking issue with Jews as white dominators by their social position and international standing, while the other way is to highlight Jews as white racist. It is Israel that demonstrates best that Jews are really white or have been whitened by Zionism and or by the creation of a genuine settler state on the European model. Either the position of the state in the Middle East or in the world shows what was already evident, namely that Jews are dominators, that is white. As the eminent racism scholar David Theo Goldberg put it, Israelis, I quote, occupy the structural position of whiteness in the Middle East. This would be the first sense of whiteness. Or, it is the internal functioning of the state of Israel that makes it evident that Jews are white, in the second sense. That is, that they are racist against the Palestinians, who, in this imagery, occupy the position of blacks. A matching second definition of Zionism is also provided by Goldberg, according to which it is as a European white movement intending to colonize and civilize the aboriginals in the Middle East. Canadian racism scholar Abigail Bakan maintains that it is by the act of the foundation of the state that Jews became white. Leaving the diaspora through the creation of Israel had a whitening effect on Jews. I quote, this transition to whiteness enabled diasporic Jews to access a level of influence and status previously unknown, contrasting sharply with the historic normalization of Jewish oppression and modern anti-Semitism in the Western world." End of quote. Now, whiteness is less a critical concept, rather an outright accusation, even with anti-Semitic overtones, especially as the perspective has gained, as we saw, a word historical outlook. It is also telling that Bakan tol talks about the necessity of reformulating the Jewish question, which she takes as something objective. According to her, the Jewish question today is linked, I quote, to specific configurations at the intersection of race, class, and colonialism, by which she refers to Israel. <clears throat> The fast developing academic field, settler colonial studies, is the latest academic enterprise to date to single out Israel, in the words of Ilan Pape, the only remaining settler colonial state. The, inter the interpretation of Israel as a colony is nothing new. Palestinian and Marxist authors such as Sayeg, Rodan Song, Edward Said, from the 60s on, have written about dispossession and colonization. The discourse on Israel as a colony was continued in the writings of the Israeli new historians and critical sociologists. A large part of academic writing on Israel has had the vocation to prove that Zionism has been a white settlers movement resulting in a colonial and now apartheid state. However, settler colonial studies is somewhat different from previous approaches working with the concept of colony as it imagines itself as a separate paradigm operating with large-scale large comparisons and applying a very rigid theoretical framework with clear-cut definitions. It has invited a variety of comparative projects seeking to explore the dynamics of settler domination and indigenous subjugation in various contexts, most commonly Australia, Canada, the United States, and New Zealand, dealing almost exclusively with white settler states. Also, it has now constituted itself as a separate academic discipline with its own academic review. Israel has been added to the country's mansion, and its treatment as a settler colony has been celebrated as a theoretical revolution in the interpretation of Zionism by the adepts of the paradigm. This so-called paradigm change is often, is often presented as a great victory over Jewish and Israeli exceptionality as breaking an age-old taboo, a discursive liberation, which is the precursor of the liberation on the ground in Palestine. At long last, in public perception as well as in academic imagery, Israel joins the series of white colonial oppressor regimes. According to this view, Israel was not treated as a colony and as an apartheid state because of the special status of the Holocaust and Jewish exceptionality. Jews' general standing in the world, and also their status either as eternal victims or whitened colonizers. 
The quantity of works on Israel as a settler colony has greatly grown in the last 15, 20 years. The academic review founded by Lorenzo Veracini, who works in Australia, in, in um, 2010, the, the review Settler Colonial Studies, has already published three special issues on Israel. And generally speaking, almost one third of the articles from these 10 years deal exclusively with Israel, I counted. And certainly there are many more which, are at, which at least mention it in a so-called comparative perspective. It seems that treating Israel as a settler colonial state is supposed to give the ultimate justification for singling it out for criticism and for the legitimation of the Palestinian struggle in all of its forms as an anti-colonial movement. This is to accentuate that the struggle is not between competitive nationalisms, but between, on the one hand, the conqueror, and the other, the conquered, the displaced, the occupied. It is the colonial framework that creates the necessary binary opposition, the absolute inequality of power relations, and the image of settlers as illegitimate invaders striving to eliminate the natives. In this regard, we should talk about some fairly general postulates, to not to say axioms adopted by the analyses, which seem to constitute an unchangeable and essentialized scheme. The settler colonial paradigm starts out with what its adepts call a distinction between colonialism and settler colonialism. The former is organized around the logic of exploitation, while the latter is characterized by a logic of elimination. In contrast to the colonizer who seeks the labor of the colonized, the settler colonizer instead seeks their land with the elimination of the native while the settler attempts to replace them. According to Patrick Wolfe, who, besides Veracini, is considered one of the founders of the paradigm, the eliminatory, eliminatory logic is inherent and absolutely primary in settler colonialism. In his many articles, Wolf emphasizes that settler colonialism is a structure that is permanent in space and time and quasi unchanged until decolonization happens. I quote, the, system, the systematic understanding of settler colonialism as a historical program of elimination not only does the necessity for violence emerge as intrinsic to the project, the violence does not go away. Indeed, it remains ever present and manifest in post-frontier symptoms. Uh, in an introduction to one of the special issues of uh, settler colonial studies, we can read, I quote, Viewed through the lens of settler colonialism, the Nakba in 1948 is not simply a precondition for the creation of Israel or the outcome of early Zionist ambitions. The Nakba is not a singular event, but is manifested today in the continuing subjection of Palestinians by Israelis. And these kinds of uh, citations abound all over. <clears throat> Thus, one should talk about in inherent eliminatory logic, a lasting, unchanged structure of dispossession and oppression, while breaking away from the framework of competing nationalisms and taking the whole history of Zionism from its beginnings as a, so as a colonial project, both as program and practice, regardless of conflicts, wars, territorial changes, religions, fundamentalisms, etc. Um, these, uh, these approaches practically never talk about the Palestinians either. They are absent from the analysis and pictured only as passive victims. However, there are some attempts at empirical verification. Veracini has a whole book entitled Israel and Settler Society, in which he compares Israel to apartheid South Africa, French Algeria, and Australia. And although he does not hide the differences between these different countries and Israel, he tries to treat those is an essential in order to, pr to preserve the concept of settler colony unchanged by emphasizing the presumed such structural continuities. <clears throat> to characterize settler colonialism, but also to broaden its theoretical and even moral significance, Patrick Wolf uses the term of structural genocide, which includes not only mass killing, but also removal and, and assimilation. I suggest that the term, I quote, I suggest that the term structural genocide avoids the questions of degree and therefore of hierarchy among victims that are entailed in qualified genocides while retaining settler colonialism's structural induration. 
In this respect, he also talks about the genocide in obedience, which means that even uh, when there is no actual genocidal practice, there is certainly more to come because the structure doesn't go away. In this sense, actuality and potentiality is the same. Um, how, could, how could all this be judged with regard to scientific methodology? In one of his articles on scientific objectivity, Max Weber states, I quote, the basic idea of modern epistemology is that concepts are and can only be theoretical means for the purpose of intellectual mastery of the empirically given, end of quote. Therefore, theoretical means should never be confounded with the ends of analysis. Concepts, in other words, are tools and not the end point of the analysis. Weber's method of ideal types is a perfect illustration of what he means by conceptual tools, which have to be constantly modified as are being measured against empirical reality. However, one does not have to be a Weberian to value this fundamental distinction and to repudiate the reification of concepts, the binaries, and the false analogies in use within critical whiteness studies, settler colonial studies, and other fields of activist social science. But fallacious methodology has a clear function in these analyses, namely a certain symbolic usage of the term whiteness or settler colony, which inherently comprise an unequivocal moral judgment. Thus, here, it is in fact the concept that is, that is the absolute endpoint of the analysis, after which action should follow, and action entirely informed by the concept. As Shayet puts it, I quote, the slippage into the crudest forms of analogical thinking is illustrative of precisely what is lost when critical thinking is re replaced by actionism, end of quote. Liberatory action will find the theory that suits it the best, and vice versa, a liberatory research agenda will inform political action in an unequivocal way. Thank you.